In the previous video, I talked through a variety of types of functions, constant, linear, quadratic, polynomial, rational, and algebraic. Algebraic was the large class that all those functions fell into. Anything made with addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, polynomials, that is positive whole exponents, and roots. This is a large class of functions with many applications, but several of the most important functions are not in this class. In this video, I want to introduce the remaining common functions that we will talk about in the course. These are all non-algebraic functions, and they're often called transcendental functions instead. The first class of transcendental functions are the trigonometric functions. There are two basic trig functions, sine and cosine. The figure here shows the graph of the sine function, this familiar wave oscillating up and down. From sine and cosine, four other trig functions are built, tangent, secant, cosecant, and cotangent. I won't review the details here, but do use the reference materials, formula sheet, library of functions, to remind yourself. Sine and cosine are defined for all real numbers. The other four have domain restrictions to avoid division by zero. The trig functions are periodic, meaning that they repeat the same shape over and over again. The sine wave is determined by two pieces of information, its amplitude and its period. On the graph, amplitude is the height of the wave, and period is the distance between the repetitions of the shape. In the diagram, I can think of this as the distance between any two peaks of the wave. Before moving on, let me say a little bit about trig. I'm not going to do a full review of trig here, but I want to remind you, or introduce you to, one of the very important conceptual ideas. Often, trig is first taught with triangles, where the trig functions are ratios of the sides of triangles. This isn't wrong, but it's not the best holistic concept for trig functions. For our purposes, it's much better to associate trig functions with a circle. Consider a circle of radius 1, as I've drawn here. A point on a circle can be determined by an angle from a fixed reference, and the conventional reference is the positive x-axis, with the movement of the angle being counterclockwise. The angle theta determines a point x, y on the edge of the circle. What are the coordinates of that point? They are exactly the trig functions. x is cos theta and y is sine theta. And I can draw a triangle inside the circle to relate this back to the triangle definition, if I wish. But it's best to think of the circle. The two basic trig functions are the coordinates of the points on a circle based on angle. Everything about trig functions, including the many identities, can be related back to this circle definition. Each trig function has an inverse. In the figure here, I've drawn the graph of the inverse tangent function. Each inverse trig function has a specific domain. Here, the inverse tangent is defined for all real numbers, but most of the others have smaller domains, and you can consult the reference materials for the specific domains. I've called this inverse tangent function arctan. That may be unfamiliar, so let me take a moment to talk about the notation for inverse trig functions. Potentially from high school calculator use, you may know the notation sine to the negative one for the inverse to sine. That is a common notation, but it comes with some confusion. With that exponent negative one, it looks like it should mean a reciprocal, one over a sine, not an inverse. It does not mean this. Sine to the negative one is not one over sine. To avoid this confusion, I choose a different notation. I write arc in front of the trig function to indicate the inverse. Therefore, the inverse of sine is arc sine, and similarly for cos, cosine arc cosine, tangent arc tangent, and so on. This, I feel, is a much clearer notation. After the trig and inverse trig functions, the next type of transcendental functions are the exponential functions. In many ways, the exponential functions can be called the most important functions in mathematics. The exponential function is ubiquitous in applications, as I shall show in the course. An exponential function is f of x equals a to the x for some base um, a. In this diagram, I've shown f of x equals 2 to the x, so the base is 2. The graph of an exponential function 
looks like the diagram here. It levels off to the negative side and grows very quickly in the positive direction. All exponential functions go through the point 0, 1, since regardless of the base, a to the 0 is always 1. It is worth pointing out a very common confusion here between exponentials and polynomials. Here are two very similar functions. Both have a constant 2, both have a variable x, and both have an exponent. The first is an exponential function because the variable is in the exponent. It is not algebraic, it is not polynomial, it is something quite different. The second is a quadratic, a polynomial, because the variable is in the base. Mixing up these two is a very common mistake, and I encourage you to pay careful attention to make sure you avoid that pitfall. I've said that any positive number a can be the base of an exponential. The larger the base, the faster the exponential grows, though all of them still start at the point 0, 1. On this graph, I've shown 2 to the x and 3 to the x, with 3 to the x clearly growing faster than 2 to the x. In between this, I've drawn e to the x. e is a special irrational number, sometimes called Euler's number. It is approximately 2.71828. For reasons that will be made clear in later weeks, it is by far the most convenient base to use for the exponential. For the vast majority of the rest of the course, and really the majority of mathematics, the base E is the only base to use. If E is a new number, this will take a bit of adjustment, but it is worth it. The inverse of the exponential function is the logarithm. By inverse, I mean it is the reverse process. If I think of functions as machines, an inverse is a machine that undoes whatever the first machine did. As a graph, the logarithm starts with a vertical asymptote along the y-axis, getting closer and closer to the y-axis as the input gets close to zero. All logarithms go through one zero, and then as the logarithm grows, it does so quite slowly. I've drawn the logarithm with base two here, which is the inverse to the exponential two to the x with base two. As with exponentials, there is a logarithm for any positive base. For the exponential 2 to the x, there is a logarithm base 2. For the exponential 3 to the x, there is a logarithm base 3. For this special exponential e to the x that I've just talked about, there is a logarithm base e. Like the exponential base e, the logarithm base e is the most important logarithm, and the one that I will use almost exclusively in this course. It is important enough that it has a special notation, lnx. It is called the natural logarithm, and the ln here in the notation reflects logarithm and natural. Finally, let me put this all together, recapping these two videos. I've built a small universe of functions from the inside out. Constant, then linear, which includes constants, then quadratic, then all polynomials, including all the previous cases, then rational, then algebraic, which again covers everything so far. Then in this video, I've talked about transcendental functions, which are beyond the algebraic functions. If I put all these together, I get a collection of functions called the elementary functions. These are the most used and most well-known functions. Outside these no functions, it is possible to consider yet more functions. Mathematics may define many non-elementary functions. And you will see the first of some of these in calculus. The world of non-elementary non functions is a large and amazing world, full of strange beasts. We'll stick to the functions we know, the elementary functions, most of the time. But it's nice to be aware that the universe of functions doesn't stop here.